Good evening and uh, welcome to those of you who are here in the audience at the British Library and those of you watching this event from wherever you may be around the world online. So it's very nice to have all of you here. Uh, finally, we're getting audiences back into the theatre at the British Library. We're delighted to see you all. Thank you for coming. I hope many of you who are out in the, the world beyond will, will be able to join us at some point in the future. So tonight's event, is uh, our title is uh, Paddington to St Pancras, London's Cathedrals of Steam. And it marks the paperback launch of Cathedrals of Steam by our tonight's speaker, Christian Walmar. And the book is exclusively available two months early tonight. Uh, we have a special deal with the publisher. It's coming out in November in paperback. And there's copies outside for those who of you who are here. And there's copies on the books tab. If you're watching online, you can go there and you can click and you can find the book to buy. So please do. Um, we called the event um, Paddington St Pancras because, of course, we are in St Pancras here in London. Um, the site of the British Library is on the former goods yard of St Pancras Station. So we're in the heart of railway land uh, where we are sitting and standing. And also Paddington because we are currently running an exhibition about Paddington Bear over in the main building up until 31st of October. So it was too good an opportunity to miss to, to reference Paddington yet again. And, and it's probably, I don't know, you can debate this as to whether the character Paddington has made the station one of the most famous in the world, possibly. Um, so uh, we're also uh, able to take your questions later on. Again, if you're watching online, there is a tab below the video screen or a form call for questions. You can send those in at any time, and we'll be able to put some of those live to our speaker, Christian, this evening. And those of you, of course, in the audience can ask questions in the normal way. Um, also, at the top of the screen, if you're watching, you have a tab for uh, to give your feedback about the event or if you want to make a donation to the British Library. So our speaker tonight, Christian Walmar, he's spoken for us many times here before. Uh, we're delighted to have him back. He's a writer, broadcaster. He writes for the Independent Evening Standard and Rail Magazine. And of course, he is one of our finest writers on transport um, now and for any time in history, I think it's fair to say. So uh, he's, a, he's a great communicator as well. Uh, his books have included everything from the Subterranean Railway, History of London Underground, to Fire and Steam, a history of how the railways transformed Britain. And of course, tonight, our topic is London's railway stations. Thank you very much. And please introduce Christian Walmar. Uh, thank you, John. I hope I can live up to that uh, uh, billing. Um, just a, a, a couple of words just to extend about uh, what I've done. Um, I've, I've now written a series. This is the eighth book in uh, a series about uh, railways and history, which started with, uh, as John mentioned, the Subterranean Railway, which is about London Underground, uh, Fire and Steam, which is about uh, Britain's railways, uh, Blood Iron and Gold, which was a slightly ambitious book about the whole of uh, uh, the impact of the railways across the world, um, and then uh, Engines of War, which was a, war, uh, a book about the strategy of warfare and how that was affected by the railways, and actually it's my own personal favourite, so do look it, do look it up. Um, and then I did uh, the, the Trans-Siberian book, which I, I gave a lecture here uh, some years ago, The History of the Trans-Siberian. I did uh, Railways and the Raj, which is... Uh, uh, obviously about uh, Indian railways, um, and I did uh, the Great American uh, Great Railway Revolution, which is about America's railways, which is the biggest railway system in the world, which not many people know that. It's still bigger than China's. And uh, uh, finally, finally uh, this one. And this one, in the way of happenstance, uh, was suggested to me uh, on the cricket field. I play cricket, and I... I'm a wicketkeeper, and I, uh, you get bored between balls, and you chat to first slip, and uh, a first slip gave me this idea of, have you done a book about uh, uh, the railway stations in London? And, of course, the fascinating thing about uh, the railway stations in London is that there's more of them than anywhere else. There's more railway uh, terminus stations, big mainline stations. We won't count the 200 or so little stations, but the, the dozen kind of uh, rail, rail, uh, terminus railway stations uh, is something that's unique uh, in the world. Paris has six or seven. Uh, most other major cities have two or three at the most. Um, so uh, 
How did that come about? Well, partly I will uh, uh, explain that, and, and partly both the inconvenience and convenience uh, of the fact that there's uh, so many. Um, and uh, the first one, that's, this is not a railway station, but it's just to show the first railway. Now, in London, uh, which was 1836, the uh, London and Greenwich Railway. And now this is an extraordinary strike. This is part of the 800 plus uh, arches that created uh, creates the viaduct on which trains are still running out of London Bridge Station. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 180 uh, odd years later, um, and uh, you know they 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 form a kind of uh, huge kind of uh, cleave, a, a great line through uh, southeast London, which um, has completely transformed the nature of that part of London, as all these stations have done. They've all been transformational. They are all big mega projects that uh, you know, these days uh, would take many years to build and cause all sorts of hassle. All these stations, but one of them, was built between 1836, this one, and 1874. So they built a dozen stations uh, in just less than 40 years. Uh, in a major city that was already uh, one of the biggest cities in the world, and it became the biggest city during uh, this period. So the London Greenwich was an exception in many uh, respects because uh, it's a suburban railway. And most of the subsequent railways uh, and terminal stations served a much longer uh, distance traveller, whereas uh, uh, this one was exclusively, initially, of course, nowadays, London Bridge, which is, became its terminus, uh, does serve uh, you know, Kent Coast and uh, uh, a few other places kind of further afield, like Canterbury or whatever, but for the most part, uh, it's still a suburban railway. And the London and Greenwich was a four-mile-long uh, railway built entirely on uh, viaducts, um, built as all these stations uh, are built with... Uh, Private money, uh, um, you know, with investors, private investors, kind of, you know, risking their few bob by by putting money in it, and it's a it's a it's an amazing structure. And this is the first terminus, which of course is not counted in my cathedrals of steam because it hardly looks like a cathedral of steam. Um, and uh, there are some remnants of this. Uh, if you if you go, uh, it's about half a mile from. Uh, uh, the eventual terminus was London Bridge, and the reason they had the temporary terminus was because, as with as we will see with all these uh, stations, the last mile or or two into central London is both the most expensive to build, but also the one that the developers, the railway companies, really wanted to build because. The nearer they got into the centre of the capital, the more uh, uh, people they could attract onto the railway and the more profit uh, they could make. So this was a little terminus uh, that, uh, when the line opened in 1836, which incidentally had a pedestrian walkway next to it at the time, um, which fortunately was later used to become uh, to widen the viaduct, and the, the viaducts have been widened in, in, in several in, several times. But uh, um, it shows that you know they were hedging their bets. They would charge a shilling or so to, to uh, walk along the viaduct. I think, no, sorry, it was tuppence for the viaduct and a shilling to get on the railway. So it was cheaper to walk, uh, which is fair enough. Um, and this is uh, one... I don't know where that rogue S came from, but anyway, that, this is one of the uh, uh, early versions of London Bridge Station. And this is, uh, this is typical, in a way, that... Uh, of the, the design of future stations. It's what one called call Italianate. Italianate kind of comes through in this story uh, uh, many times, and I suppose it really means kind of mock Italian. But you can imagine that building uh, in a little piazza uh, somewhere in Umbria or Tuscany. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the kind of absolute uh, you know, lack of kind of respect for their own heritage by the Victorians uh, was that this only lasted about five or six years. They just demolished this building and built another one um, because they, didn't, they, they needed to expand the station. So uh, uh, there's absolutely no remnants of this kind of quite uh, quaint little station, which was you know, probably the first uh, 
uh, uh, decent station that had been built for the London, uh, the, the London Greenwich, because the, the first terminus was really just an incline up to the viaducts and not very much else. Um, so going across uh, from there, we, we now kind of look at some more conventional railways that uh, are more what you imagine in terms of the fact they're long distance railways. Um, and the first to uh, reach uh, London. And I say reach London advisedly because actually the, the, the railways, the, the money came from the north and, and it was really about kind of building railways into London rather than the idea of building railways from London. And, and there was not that kind of same dominance that London has today uh, that, uh, uh, th that there was uh, at the time. And uh, Euston has this arch. Now, I'm a bit controversial about this arch. This arch was later demolished, as we all see, um, uh, in the 1960s. And I think it's a pretty useless thing, actually. I don't really think it's very attractive. It's really called a pro propylanium. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like a Greek temple, isn't it? Uh, you know, with Doric columns. And uh, frankly, uh, it served no purpose. The, the, the buildings on the side were the ticket offices and the goods offices and the likes. Um, and uh, the railway initially uh, couldn't actually uh, climb up the hill under its own steam. The trains were just not powerful enough. If, you, if you're familiar with Euston, uh, um, you will know that Louise actually goes uh, 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 straight into tunnel and, and it actually goes up towards, uh, uh, towards Camden. And uh, so initially, uh, those two chimneys kind of uh, 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 there... Uh, were actually uh, the, 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 the chimneys for the static engines that hauled up uh, the carriages up to, uh, this is Camden, um, and uh, um, then the, where they were fixed, the locomotives in those buildings, and then uh, went off uh, um, up to Birmingham. That was the London and Birmingham Railway, which later con connected or soon connected with the Grand Junction Railway, which then connected with Liverpool and Manchester and so on. So that, which is the West Coast main line today, uh, largely, uh, largely uh, unchanged. Um, and of course, on the way down, uh, it was a bit of fun. They just rolled down the hill with a brake man on uh, uh, at the back, kind of just uh, uh, putting it to a halt. And, and uh, when they had to haul them up, initially they did have to be pushed onto the rope uh, um, and clip onto the rope and then hauled up. So it was quite a kind of physical effort uh, to, to uh, operate this railway. So, um, uh, and um, this is not a terminus, but I included this really to show the trouble with which the early railway companies had to uh, make sure that they appeased the local landowners. This is Primrose Hill, uh, Primrose Tunnel, um, which goes under uh, land owned by Eton College. Um, in fact, there's some roads around there called Eton College Road, and, well, and they still own that land. Um, and they were very intent on the fact, well, they didn't really want their railway, the railway to go through it. It could have actually gone in an embankment. You probably didn't really need that tunnel, but they didn't want to lose the value of the development land above, so they insisted on a tunnel, and they insisted on this grand entrance to, to kind of... Uh, you know, show uh, uh, you know who they were and how important they were, um, and of course, Euston itself. Initially, this the the, the hall was uh, added a little bit later, uh, a few years later, along with a, a couple of hotels. It had two hotels. We will come back to hotels many times in this story, um, and it had this great hall, which was uh, the passengers would actually uh, come through here uh, um, and go up to the uh, uh, platforms. Uh, uh, there and, and sit and wait in this amazing, uh, over-the-top, possibly Baroque sort of star I'm in a, a hall, um, which of course was sacrificed in the 1960s because it was in the wrong place. It was it, it would have prevented any expansion of the of the uh, uh, of the station. But we can debate whether whether it really was necessary or not. But uh, it was a fantastic waiting room. Um, I only just vaguely remember it from uh, the early 1960s when I was, I was, I confess, but don't tell anyone, a train spotter. Um, uh, and what was, what's, 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 what's um, in, uh, sorry, and there also, uh, I ought to mention, also above that there was another, there was another fantastic room called the boardroom, um, which was where the 
where the directors met. Um, and, and the whole thing was, was actually partly that the investors were from the north and the Midlands. And it's really a bit of showing off, particularly the Doric Arch. It's basically saying, we are this great railway company, which actually became the biggest company in the world, briefly, uh, in the 1860s, 70s. Uh, so they were showing how great they were, you know, how important they were. And the Doric Arch was very much part of that. You know, we, we've landed in London, folks, and guess who's boss? They couldn't go any further into London uh, because of this. Uh, um, they would have wanted to, uh, I mean, all these companies, as we all see, would have probably wanted to go uh, further into uh, London. But what happened was that, uh, as a result of having a commission um, um, which, on which the railway interests were not allowed to dominate, very important that, um, and they basically said uh, that effectively what's in Zone 1, they didn't call it Zone 1 in those days, but what is Zone 1, you are not allowed to build uh, um, any railway stations. So they had to, this was in response to an idea that there might have been one station in Farringdon that would have spread out in all the directions, which would have been very handy, but I think probably unworkable in the 20th century when uh, you know, rail usage went, went, went up so, so massively. And it would have required enormous amount of demolition. So instead, uh, you know, we get the situation where pretty much all the stations, and even Euston is sort of on it, uh, you know, Paddington, uh, Victoria, uh, uh, Blackfriars, which was briefly a, a terminus station, Cannon Street, uh, and Liverpool Street, are, are all, all on the circle line, which wasn't actually built till 40 years after this. But they envisage the circle line. And that's, that also is interesting because, as British, we don't do planning. We yeah. don't like the idea of kind of working things out in advance. Uh, and, you know, the results we see today with uh, the lorries. Um, but that's not my subject here today. But um, uh, essentially, we don't do planning. And so, so this was quite an exception because, by and large, the British railways, as with the Americans, actually, were built by people developing kind of railway uh, uh, plans to build a line between uh, a particular place and another place, going to Parliament and saying, please, please, sir, can we build this line? And if they had lots of chums in Parliament and if they had enough money, they would give me, could be given permission. And if they didn't, uh, then they would have to... Uh, 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 come up with some different idea. Uh, and so it, 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 this was quite exceptional that uh, they planned. And London, it, it, it's a testimony to the power of London, to the power of the big landlords, the Duke of Bedford and all those people uh, um, uh, who, who had the power to stop uh, uh, the railway companies, who were themselves were powerful. Uh, from uh, incursing right into the centre of London. And no, we don't do planning, we do competition. And nothing uh, illustrates that more than where we are now, um, just the other side of uh, St Pancras. Um, but having two huge railway stations, we're not the only ones guilty of that. If you've been to Paris, the Gare de l'Est is a stone throw from the Gare du Nord. Um, and, you know, they, 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 it served different destinations. So uh, we're not unique, but I think we have taken this to the most extreme. And uh, the fact is that uh, we ended up with 12 major railway stations um, because of competition. Bec you know, because if, if, it'd be, if they ever had been coordinated, we'd probably have four or five. Um, you know, maybe six, but really we don't need a dozen, but, you know, we've now got them. Um, and as, I, as you will see, it, it's amazing that they've all survived with one exception, uh, and there was one addition in 1899. Um, so uh, obviously this is King's Cross uh, built by the Great Northern in 1853, and uh, St Pancras built by the Midland Railway uh, in 1869. And, and the reason that... Uh, the Midland Railway then built its own terminus. It, its trains initially went into uh, King's Cross, but it, it built uh, its own railway station uh, because the Great Northern treated its trains as kind of second-class citizens and gave them less priority on the train paths, and eventually they said, no, no, we've had enough. We, we're the Midland Railway. We've got to show that 
we've we've got cojones as well and so we're going to build uh, our own station and of course it had to be superior to uh, uh, or allegedly now actually i confess my favorite station is not st pancras but king's cross and i show this picture just uh, you know this is a, a, a contemporary early picture and it just shows the pure simplicity of it the, the elegance the Again, it's Italianate. It's got a tower in the middle with a clock and so on. But uh, just those clean lines uh, which have survived through to this day. And, that, and there was clutter in front of it uh, in several, uh, several different types of clutter. This was, this was actually called, uh, with possibly slightly racist kind of intonation, uh, that uh, it was called the African Village. Um, and it was a, a sort of cluster of buildings in front of uh, uh, King's Cross. And then, uh, and I don't bother showing this, but in the 1960s, there was another incarnation of kind of rather shabby buildings in front of it, which a few years ago were taken out to leave this. And, and you know, 1853, uh, uh, you know, it's exactly the same. Um, and it survived and it, and, it, and it looks so elegant, so clean, uh, so modern looking. I mean, you, you couldn't guess when this was built. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that's why uh, um, it's my favourite. Uh, and this whole kind of cluster of railway lines uh, behind and underneath it. Um, and only recently reopened one of these tunnels. And I'm not quite sure which one it is. Um, I think it's called the Gasworks Tunnel. Um, uh, because to, to, to expand uh, uh, services. Uh, uh, to enable more trains to, to, to use it and more trains to go through uh, on Thames. And, of course, the, it connected in with the underground. Um, uh, the, the early uh, underground was really about connecting uh, the mainline stations. Uh, so the Circle Line, you know, could, you could run from Paddington onto the Circle Line, you could run from King's Cross onto the Circle Line, you could run from Liverpool Street onto the Circle Line. You know, that, that was the idea and of course then it got too crowded and they stopped doing that and closed most of those uh, co connections um so this is st pancras look i'm not doing st pancras down it is a fantastic building and and uh you know this is the barlow train shed which was built before the main bit uh, of the hotel in the front uh, a couple of a, a couple of two or three years because you know, gee, they ran out of money or they were short of money. As, as uh, you know, this story, uh, virtually every, every the railway company that uh, uh, did this ended up being uh, uh, short of money. But so they put this wooden framework on which you can see that the initial arch is being built. Uh, eventually they built another one of these uh, wooden frameworks. Um, but you can just see the scale of it. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, quite, quite uh, uh, extraordinary. And, and that's the, the hotel, which was... Uh, at the front, which was uh, built later. I always think that, uh, even today, that this area in front, they don't quite know what to do with. There's now a nice pub there, but uh, it, it's kind of rather underused, and, and, and there's parts of it that are not quite uh, really, uh, uh, I think, kind of uh, 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 well used now. And of course, that there is the Great Northern Hotel, which exceptionally of uh, the... Hotels built uh, with each of these stations, and virtually everyone had a hotel going with it, uh, was not built right in front of the station, which is great, because they would have covered those arches, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the, the building it is uh, uh, today. And that's, uh, you know, that, was, that was it during the uh, reconstruction uh, for the Eurostar at the Eurostar terminus. And, of course, they cut out some, some bits of the... Uh, uh, the undercroft, uh, and so there all the shops are actually uh, down down the bottom, uh, uh, underneath where the trains are. And this is this is the underneath as it was, the undercroft, and uh, with the arches that were designed to enable uh, beer barrels. That it was one of the main uh, forms of freight that arrived, uh, enable uh, beer barrels to be uh, pushed through. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that, that determined actually the size of um, uh, the arches. And, and there were rail lines that both went down into this area as well as rail lines which went into up. up. And, of course, there is, as I'm sure you know, uh, an important difference between King's Cross, the lines out of King's Cross, and the lines out of St Pancras, which is that the lines out of King's Cross 
go below the canal. We'll, we'll see the canal in a minute. We go below the canal, and the ones after St Pancras go above the canal, which is why you have to sort of climb up to get the trains, and in King's Cross you don't. Um, and uh, again, that was almost a kind of uh, statement by uh, the, the Midland Railway, saying, well, you've gone underneath, we're going up, we're going above it. And of course, they've done a wonderful job of uh, the refurbishment um, uh, today. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great hotel, there's the Gilbert Scott restaurant, um, there's various kind of uh, 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 wonderful function rooms and so on. Um, okay, so um, we're still only in uh, the 1850s. Uh, we've gone back to the 1850s. I mean, um, the Paddington was actually the one that was built consciously as a cathedral. It even has a transept and a, and a, a nave, you know, and, and uh, which you can see in another picture. Um, and uh, you know, it was built. Uh, Difficult to say. It was built kind of, there was an architect, but Brunel was involved with the architect. And it, can you imagine working with Brunel and him not kind of bossing you around and saying uh, what you had to do and what you, what you were not allowed to do? So I suspect that uh, there was a lot of Brunel went into this. And it was built uh, really in the fashion of uh, the Crystal Palace at the Great Exhibition. Uh, which, of course, uh, was not in Crystal Palace at the time. It was in Hyde Park um, and was, was moved out to Crystal Palace and then burnt down uh, uh, in the 1920s. But, um, so it was, it was quite consciously kind of uh, a, uh, a, a, a similar style of, uh, of development. Um, and this is a photo that I got wrong in the initial edition of the book, but it's been corrected in the paper, which I hope you'll all buy because it's, it will really help because the kind bookseller has come all the way from Newham to, to uh, sell books. So please do buy the book afterwards. But, um, and it's your first chance to get the paper back. But uh, I made a mistake, in the, in, thanks to Getty Images, actually, which is that I said this was uh, the uh, 1900s. And in fact, it looks rather like the 1900s. The clothes are fairly uh, kind of Edwardian. Uh, so that, that loco looks pretty ancient uh, and so on. But I made a mistake, and the mistake, the eagle-eyed readers that I have spotted that uh, the statue in the, in the, in the corner there uh, was a, First World, uh, a memorial to the First World War, so it poss couldn't possibly be in the 1900s, it had to be in the 1920s, um, and it wasn't. I, I, I tried gamely to say it might have been the Boer War, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, anyway, it's de delightful that I have readers who, who, who correct it, and it has been corrected in the paperback version. But this, I think this shows what a kind of wonderful, you know, what an airy, uh, fantastic uh, station Paddington is. Though, from the outside, it's not very, you know, the, the hotel's kind of okay, um, but the station is really hidden. Uh, is in a, in a kind of cutting but, but below and underneath the, the, the hotel. And uh, I mean, the way I always go to it is from uh, Parade Street and you go down an incline into the, into the station. So it doesn't have a kind of grand entrance. And that's a feature of many of these stations, that they don't really have the entrances they deserve. Um, and I think that's a feature of the fact that we did not develop a vernacular that went with the railways. We adapted various styles, you know, such as Italianate and Beaux-Arts and Gothic um, and so on, um, without ever designing what should a station look like and what facilities does it need and how do you, how do you kind of accommodate those. So, so a lot of the stations were quite higgledy-piggledy. And when we come to, to Waterloo, uh, you'll see that, that that was kind of the, the, the one that, that was most... Uh, uh, poorly, uh, poorly designed. So um, there is also there's another feature of this is that there's a series of, of, of stations that we've already seen, Spa Road, um, that were the initial terminuses of particular lines. And as I mentioned, they, they were all trying to get into the centre of London. The city uh, was, of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the main kind of target where they hoped they could, could uh, you know, tap into all the city works, the growing financial sector, but also the West End. Um, and, and, none of, and, and none of them really achieved in getting the perfect kind of uh, 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 area for their station. They're kind of still slightly on the outskirts of both the, the city and, uh, 
uh, and the uh, uh, West End. And so Nine Elms was, was uh, the initial terminus of uh, the London and Southampton. And uh, uh, it, it was next to the uh, Thames, and uh, so you could, you could kind of uh, get out and take a boat along uh, the Thames uh, to both the West End and uh, the city, but it was all a bit of a slow process, and so it wasn't very satisfactory. So uh, um, about a decade uh, later, it was replaced by uh, Waterloo. And as I give that little quote from uh, Three Men in a Boat, uh, um, it was it, it, it was a mess, um, and uh, it had kind of three different sections, and nobody quite knew. You know, it didn't have the great indicator boards that we have today, and and so on. Nobody quite knew where uh, they were supposed to catch a train, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, Waterloo became the bigger station because it built up kind of incrementally as the 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 the, the, the uh, demand went up, for, you know, serving you know a whole chunk of the southeast and commuter traffic, and as you'll see, horse traffic and and the like. Uh, but it was not a very successful station until until it was uh, uh, rebuilt. And famously, uh, it served the dead, um, which uh, there was this little uh, station next door uh, that ran trains down the same lines, of course, and uh, to Brookwood, which is on the Surrey Hampshire border. Um, where a huge, this company, the London Necropolis uh, Company, uh, set up this uh, 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 huge cemetery, hoping um, that uh, they would fulfil the task of becoming London's main cemetery. They didn't quite succeed in that. But uh, every day at uh, 12 o'clock, uh, uh, there was a train uh, that would have... Uh, um, different carriages for uh, different classes of people, different carriages for different religions, um, and they might have one or two carriages where the, the local golfers might hop on because the, 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 the train was actually cheaper than the normal trains uh, for passengers uh, as a concession to the bereaved. Um, and they did quite a good business in sort of um, uh, children's homes and old people's homes and various mental institutions and so on uh, in burying people. Um, uh, but it never was quite as successful as they hoped for. But it stayed, it remained until the Second World War, uh, so from uh, about the 1860s. So, uh, you know, it, it survived for quite a long time. In fact, my mother is buried in Brookwood because they had they, they divided the cemetery in different sections. So that my mother was Swedish and there's a Swedish section and there's kind of various Middle Eastern sections and, and, and German sections and so on. So, so they, they, they uh, uh, um, you know, they, they, they still, but there's still a lot of space in there if, you, if you're looking. Um, uh, so... Again, another example of a station that wasn't quite in the right place, which is Bishopsgate, um, and this one survived for 34 years until uh, Liverpool Street was built. It was in a poor area on the uh, eastern side of the uh, city, um, rough area of beggars and tramps and, and uh, so on, um, and uh, uh, was unpopular for that reason. Um, but the Great Eastern Railway, which built it and which merged with a couple of other railways, was always impoverished. Not a good railway area to the east, um, apart from actually what did develop as a good area was, was London suburbs, and, and lots of suburbs grew out as a result of the Great Eastern running a lot of workmen's trains, as we'll see in a minute. But uh, running out to Norwich and Ipswich and the like, and the coast, not good railway areas, fairly underpopulated, um, not very well-off areas, and so on. So, so the Great Eastern was always a railway that struggled. Um, but So that's why it took 34 years to get enough capital to build uh, uh, Liverpool Street, which was a bit of a mess. Uh, and you can see that, really, from this picture, because there are different bits of it where some platforms are longer than others. Um, it, was not a, it was not a kind of uh, happy station. I do remember train spotting there and getting very lost kind of in the, uh, there was a walkway at the top and you couldn't find which platforms were where and, and so on. But it was um, hugely heavily used by the workmen's trains. And there were different classes of workmen's trains. So there were uh, the very early trains, which were for the labourers um, who would have to come to work early. Then there was sort of uh, a slightly superior one for the clerks who would... Um, 
actually uh, uh, pay a little bit more. And then there was you know, the bankers and the more affluent commuters who would pay the full fare who would come through uh, later. So uh, you know, it was, it was um, very heavily used and, and they, they, they developed a whole series of suburban services. And the, 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 the suburbs that built up were really determined by the fact that uh, they had easy access to the railway, so Walthamstow and Enfield and uh, all those, uh, Edmonton, all those sort of places, uh, built up as a result of uh, um, uh, uh, Liverpool Street. Um, and then there's the cute little station of uh, Fenchurch Street, which really only, initially did serve more than the play, but it's only got four platforms and it, it, it served, uh, uh, in us to just serve South End really. Um, uh, but it did kind of actually go to uh, a few other places. Um, and again, um, you know, was it really necessary? Uh, you know, as an addition, it was a bit of competition with, uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, Liverpool Street built by a different railway company and so on. But, you know, uh, but no, it survived pretty much intact, um, uh, except this bit above, uh, which rather ruined the kind of uh, uh, view and the feel of the station at the top but uh, again you have to climb upstairs like many of the stations it was the initial run was built on viaducts um, and and uh, uh, so you have to walk up to uh, 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 to the platforms but it's it's pretty much survived unscathed John Betjeman who wrote a book and we'll hear more about that uh, about the stations kind of really loved it he thought it was uh, London's hidden gem and it's bloody difficult to find I mean when I went to go and uh, research it and stuff. Uh, even then, I still found difficulty uh, uh, for finding it on my bicycle. Um, you know, because it, it's just tucked away. Yeah, not, it's not actually in Fenchurch Street. Doesn't help not being in Fenchurch Street. Um, and then we have the 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 the, the three uh, sisters, which uh, I've called them the three sisters, which actually uh, um, broke one of the cardinal rules of the metropolitan. Uh, commission on railway terminus, termini, as I, uh, terminuses, as I call them, um, which is that they all involve bridges over the river uh, to uh, reach uh, North London. And uh, each of these three stations, Victoria, Charing Cross and Cannon Street, uh, all required a bridge be built. They were all built in the 1860s. Um, and in fact, uh, Victoria was two stations, um, as you can sort of see from this picture, really. Uh, which was the, the, the London, Brighton and South Coast, which uh, operate on the right uh, of our picture there, and the uh, uh, London South Eastern, which, uh, uh, or the South Eastern Railway, sorry, which um, uh, operated the rest of the trains. Um, and even today, you know, there's still vestiges of a wall between the two. Um, and, you know, I took the train to Brighton yesterday, and you still have to kind of walk to a slightly different place to get the trains to, to, to uh, Brighton. And this was kind of great rivalry again that resulted in it. It didn't become the uh, station for the continent until between the wars, actually. Charing Cross uh, was the initial uh, station that uh, was used in the First World War to take people to, uh, 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 notably soldiers, to, to uh, the coast. And uh, Charing Cross, again, sorry, Victoria uh, did have, you know, a, a hotel in the front, as they all do, Grosvenor Hotel, pretty boring hotel, but hey. Um, and the Charing Cross Hotel, pretty much the same sort of class. Uh, it did have this slight different look, and a sort of possibly slightly Beaux-Arts look about it, uh, you know, quite French. Um, and uh, 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 that was the railway station that got closest to the West End. Um, and uh, you know that was that was the, the best effort, as it were. Um, uh, the the uh, south uh, west of what was the London Southampton, which became the South Western Railway, uh, had plans to build a station in Whitehall, um, which never materialised. And they even started building the bridge across the river at Whitehall, but it uh, it, it never happened. Um, as with many, many such projects, one could write another book about the failed projects, but it would be less interesting because none of them would be there. But uh, there was certainly a, a whole host of failed projects. And the best story about Charing Cross is that it was about a seven-minute ride to Cannon Street. Most of the trains went just from Charing Cross to Cannon Street and then out to Kent or whatever. And uh, the ladies of the night did a roaring trade, apparently, because it was all compartment kind of trains. 
And in the seven minutes it took them, they, uh, they could op offer their services um, uh, and make a few bob and uh, um, uh, all done very quickly. Um, and uh, apparently this was quite a well-known kind of, uh, uh, quite a known, well-known feature of, uh, of Charing Cross. And, and meeting under the clock at Charing Cross, which had certain romantic meeting, meaning, also had a rather louche uh, meaning. Um, that's what it looks like today. They're irritating enough, they've taken over the sort of mansard roof and, and other bits and kind of cleaned it up a bit, which I, I don't think is an improvement at all. But anyway, uh, um, at least it survived, uh, which the station at Cannon Street did not survive, uh, which is probably the only one I think that has been uh, uh, demolished. Um, but those two towers on the side uh, were initially water towers um, to provide water for the... For the uh, uh, engines and now they're, they're merely uh, decorative. Again, as I say, they stretched out uh, across the river, and there's this complex series of lines uh, south of the river linking, uh, uh, you know, trains out of Charing Cross, Waterloo East, uh, Cannon Street, and London Bridge. Um, you know, really complicated kind of uh, uh, series of lines in the in the centre in this in the centre of London. And uh, this really I only used, because I used it in the book, it's just a fabulous picture. This was also built by the South Eastern Railway. So the South Eastern actually built, uh, you know, the half of uh, Victoria, uh, uh, Charing Cross and uh, Cannon Street. And not surprisingly, it was in financial difficulties and eventually merged with the London and, and Chatham, which... Uh, uh, built Blackfriars, which is no longer a, a terminus, but you can see the insignia of the London and Chatham on uh, next, if you go over Waterloo Bridge and look to your left, and it's, it's still there. So uh, uh, those are the three linked railways, uh, linked uh, uh, stations on, uh, uh, on the North Bank, uh, along with London Bridge, all serving kind of suburban market. And Broad Street was the one that uh, has, be, uh, has been demolished next to Liverpool Street. Uh, it was the terminus of the North London uh, Railway, uh, quite a successful railway for a while. It was kind of the third largest uh, uh, in terms of passenger numbers, um, but very much got uh, squeezed out by uh, British Rail, which um, wanted to redevelop uh, Liverpool Street. And so uh, uh, pretty much uh, um, did what British Rail did, which was to stop using the putting trains into it, letting it die, and say, oh, well, nobody's using it. And you say, well, there's no trains, but no, no, nobody's using it, so we need to demolish it. But actually, I think, uh, as you'll see from the picture of Liverpool Street I offer later, I think that um, uh, it's a pretty good development. Um, and then the last one, um, which is uh, Marylebone and uh, 1899, just in time. There's, there's a neatness about you know, the, 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 the last main line, which was the line, you know, the, 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 the great central line, built to uh, Marylebone and went out to uh, uh, Leicester and Nottingham and um, even Sheffield and, and uh, Manchester. And was the mad idea of uh, uh, Watkin, who, uh, who also built the Metropolitan Railway. Um, and uh, it, it really was an unnecessary uh, extra line. It duplicated a lot of service, a lot of other services. Its idea was that it would provide a better service. Uh, the gauge was bigger, so it could have bigger trains. Um, and, of course, it's, it's a great shame that the, the main line out of it uh, uh, has been... It was closed uh, by beaching the, the line out to the, to the East Midlands and stuff because, boy, they could have used it as the basis of HS2, but, hey, um, you know, they weren't to know that. Um, uh, Maribel was one of the ones that was most threatened by closure. Um, because at one point there was this mad idea that you could replace railways with coaches uh, and run them through the existing tunnels and you could concrete over the lines and run them through. And actually, uh, uh, Alfred Sherman, who's one of Thatcher's advisors, was a great fan of what was called the Railway Conversion League, um, and which... Um, in my forthcoming book, which is about British railways, uh, I go into some detail about that story. And it's quite extraordinary that I mean, it didn't happen, but uh, you know, it was actually given a serious kind of thought for, 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 quite, a long, uh, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, um, 
Eventually, it was chucked out by Peter Parker, and it was never really a viable idea. But, but, but Marylebone was almost a, a victim of this crazy idea. So just to sum up at the end, um, these projects that I say, they're mega projects. They're not just about the railways. There's so much more to the way they affected London. I mean, they are such an integral part of London's history that it's surprising, actually, that more books haven't been written on them and more kind of uh, credence paid to uh, uh, their uh, importance uh, in terms of all these things, in terms of slum clearance and, and, and land use and uh, et cetera, stimulating the uh, commuting, as, as, as we see. I mean, slum clearance, the estimates vary between about 60 and 90,000 homes are demolished to make way for all these stations. Um, and, of course, it was claimed that they were all slums. A lot of them were, and a lot of them were in poor condition, Summerstown and the like, but some of them were not quite as, as uh, badly off. And initially, the railway companies didn't have to pay any compensation at all. They could just ride roughshod over them. Um, but uh, uh, as time went on, um, they uh, were forced to uh, provide some compensation. Um, and, and by, by various bits of legislation. And even then, and, and in Maryland, they actually were forced to build some, some housing uh, uh, around it. And this was the sort of housing, back-to-back -back housing, that uh, um, they actually demolished. Um, uh, but as I say, they did so little for the people displaced that often the areas round railway stations uh, attracted all these people to have been uh, uh, chucked out and became quite kind of run-down areas. So even though the railways were the great prosperous uh, companies of this era, it, it, it meant that uh, um, the areas around them were often quite in decline, prostitution, drugs and so on. I mean, one can remember King's Cross, uh, you know, 20 years ago. This area around here was, was appalling, you know, uh, uh, I do remember getting importuned, uh, um, you know, for, by drug addicts and whatever, uh, wandering around uh, uh, King's Cross. Um, and this is here. This, this is the uh, Midland Railway Milk and Fish Depot. I'm probably standing exactly uh, on this spot, um, uh, which, which was, uh, uh, you know, which was um, part of every station. So every station that we've talked about had a goods yard that accompanied with it. And some of those still survive. St Pancras, for example, has that area kind of uh, uh, just outside it, which is quite, still quite large. And uh, some of these areas have been uh, actually uh, well redeveloped, notably this one, um, uh, which is behind us now, um, which I think you know, is one of London's great developments. Uh, um, you know, it, it's sometimes criticised as being private space and so on, but they've built a lot of social homes. They've made use of uh, the existing railway structures. This is a coal drop yard, so the, the wagons used to kind of go up here and then drop their coal into, into, uh, uh, into great big hods. Um, uh, um, and, and, and this building was, was a, a granary, um, it's now called Granary Square, and uh, was a huge warehouse um, and there was, there was a, a large number of railway lines that kind of went in a curve kind of, kind of around here, up to about 40 sidings or something. Um, and, of course, it was no coincidence that the canal was there so that, because they, they took stuff from the canal uh, onto the railway. So, I mean, and, and I think the redevelopment has been absolutely fantastic. So railways stimulated the growth in commuting, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, you know, massively, uh, um, and, and the circle line kind of contributed to that. Hotels, every one of these stations had a hotel that went with it, nearly everyone. Um, and uh, um, they, were, they were actually mostly pretty posh hotels, and, and they actually ended up improving uh, the quality of, uh, of uh, London hotels immeasurably. Uh, you know, they were, they were you know, desirable places to stay. And of course, it was, you know, it's obviously needed hotels, uh, you know, for people taking early trains or people arriving late at night and so on. Uh, so the hotels and the stations really went, uh, uh, went together. As I said, that's the Great Northern, which fortunately was not built in front. Uh, and then kind of special events, you know, Wembley, uh, horse racing. I mean, Waterloo uh, dealt with both, of course, uh, the uh, uh, Ascot and the Epsom Derby. 
um, and had great uh, links with horses. There were a lot of there were actually horse trains out of Waterloo because there were so many uh, trainers who, who lived in the, in that area that they used the, the railway services and so on. Um, and of course, the London Underground. I mean, you know, one could say that uh, the the London Underground was built to support those stations. The Circle Line was was you know, as I said, 1884 was was pretty much the first. Uh, to be completed, and, and then all the rest sprouts out from the circle line. So, uh, you know, one could argue that it was thanks to this huge number of stations that, that the underground was so uh, extensive. So just to cover between the wars, there was only really one major development, which is the Waterloo, which I think is hideous. <laughs> I've, I've never gone for this victory arch. Um, it has all sorts of bizarre statues there. It has the names of various... Uh, places we've had wars, uh, it's got a huge uh, uh, memorial inside on both sides to uh, soldiers uh, who, who uh, worked for the railway company and, and were lost in the First World War uh, and the Second World War, and it's got victory at the top here. But uh, by and large, um, uh, it was opened by uh, Queen Mary because King George uh, V was ill on the day um, uh, in 1922. And... Um, uh, you know, I think uh, it was a, the result of a, a 10, 12 years of development, and I think some compromises were made in the in the uh, design. So not not one of the best. Um, uh, the war damage, uh, amazing. None of the stations got completed. Sorry, this is some bankers, but it it uh, 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 there was one night in May uh, 1941 where uh, virtually all the main line railway stations were bombed. Clearly, the Luftwaffe were after them. But, uh, and although this one outside Victoria was damaged quite extensively, they all got working within a month or so, which is pretty, pretty amazing, really, and, and, and a testimony to the resilience of uh, uh, the railway workers. And, of course, then there was the deliberate de demolition of the Doric Arch, which has been plonked in some canal somewhere, and, and they, they've numbered the bits, and there's kind of people who want to put it back together again. Uh, um, but, you know, and, and with HS2, uh, I mean, maybe HS2 will think that this is a great PR exercise, but it will cost several million pounds, and given how much HS2 is costing, I doubt whether they will uh, uh, actually, in the end, do it. Um, and I took a series of pictures. Uh, I broke the lockdown, and I went round all the stations, because I had to go round them all to... Uh, 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 for the final chapter of the book. The final chapter of the book is my conversation with, or my pretend conversation with John Betjeman. John Betjeman wrote a book called London Historic Railway Stations, uh, which was published in, in, uh, in 1970 or 71. And uh, he was deeply depressed. He thought that what had happened to Euston would happen to all the railway stations. And in fact, it, it didn't. You know, only, only, as I say, only Broad Street was demolished. Um, and the redevelopments have been uh, much better. This was Euston, though, and I, I, nothing, I, I can't forgive Euston. I mean, it just, it's just too awful. And it, however much they dry, and they put some seats in, if famously there were no seats initially in it, there was no waiting room. Uh, um, uh, I really don't think they can do anything with it. So it might get totally demolished for HS2, but they haven't yet decided what they're going to do with it. But thanks to Betterman, who advised on this one, and, and uh, BR took to heart his... Uh, uh, his ideas, they started doing some really good redevelopments. They were given permission to exploit the air above stations, and that gave them the money to uh, redevelop uh, stations well. And uh, uh, I think Liverpool, this is Liverpool Street, and I think there was a great effort, and they, they, they did up these columns uh, uh, beautifully. They kind of restored all the metalwork, um, and they got rid of the walkway and created this, um, uh, it's a very simple design and I think very effective um, and, and it was a great job this is uh, the, Euro, the Eurostar that was terminal uh, at uh, Waterloo uh, what was called Waterloo International uh, the extra five platforms which took them ten years to put into use for suburban services but they have at last uh, done that just as Covid kind of happened and reduced usage um, and this is undoubtedly the best redevelopment I, I just I think this is stunning. Um, and uh, as I say, I prefer it to next door. And uh, um, uh, was was done about 10 years ago now, or 12 years ago. And uh, um, 
re realign the station so that the main entrance kind of is, was down the side instead of the front, and that left the front to be its, its actually clear and modern self. And this is the last one that has been done recently, uh, which is London Bridge, which is a total mess. And again, all these projects have cost four, five, six hundred million pounds. You know, these are, are big. Uh, uh, mega projects, uh, but I, I, I think I think this is this beautiful and and it's still not an entirely coherent station because there's an up and a down and, and whatever. It's still quite difficult, but um, beautiful. And then uh, as my last picture, dear old John Betjeman looking at uh, the above bit, and that's one of my criticisms of the St Pancras. If you use St Pancras, you'll know that this upper area is barely ever used, um, and they encourage everybody to use the walk past the shops uh, down at the bottom. And there's this a vast area to the side, uh, um, uh, to, to the side here, uh, which is totally unused because of some security reason or whatever. But it's very irritating that when you get off the Eurostar train, you can't just walk into London. You have to walk downstairs and walk sideways into the throng. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, redevelopment. And uh, so, uh, um, sorry, that's actually out of date. That. It, Get you the book for ten ninety nine over there. Um, uh, that's the hardback. Uh, but uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, happy to answer questions. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, okay, we'll start with you, sir. Do you think HS2 is a white elephant? <laughs> <laughs> People always ask me that. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, um, I mean, what is extraordinary is that HS2 is is being developed at a time when, uh, I mean, I didn't emphasise this enough in the presentation that uh, you know the use of railways is going to change and uh, commuting is not going to come back in the way it's come back before. Um, uh, and overall usage is at 60%. Uh, road usage is at 105% of pre-COVID levels. Um, you know, I, I don't. I think spending 100 million pounds on uh, 100 billion pounds on a on a, on on that particular railway is is misspent. They should be spending it on improving existing lines and whatever. But my views are well known in the, uh, on my website, sir. First of all, thank you very much. A fascinating uh, talk. Um, you, you said one thing that particularly made me prick up my ears when you were talking about my personal favourite London station, which is Marylebone. I just like the feel of it inside. And indeed, my daughter, who lives in Birmingham, caught, chose today to go from Marylebone rather than Euston. Good choice. Said, Good just choice. much nicer. Um, but you mentioned that originally they had a wider gauge. Now, I've travelled a lot in Russia, so I know about trains with a wider gauge, but why on earth... No, no, it's a, it's, it's, sorry, I should explain. It's not that four foot eight and a half was any different, right? It's, it's called the loading gate. In other words, the tunnels are bigger and able to take uh, larger trains, but still on four foot eight and a half. In Russia, they have uh, uh, five foot uh, three, I think it is, isn't it? Uh, um, and, and so they actually have a wider track width uh, but uh, uh, the, the the thing they wanted, they want, they thought that if they have a, a you know bigger tunnels and the like, more expensive to build, of course, but that you could then provide better facilities on the trains. Oh, thank you. Uh, perhaps afterwards I could tell you a story about the, why the Russians have a wider gauge. I couldn't. Okay. I couldn't possibly. I'll be very keen. To, I have written about that, and I have various theories about it. But I'll be very keen to hear that, sir. At the front here. Oh, sorry. I sorry. The online one. Yes. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Is, are we at the front. Yeah. Yes. Wait a minute. Sorry, wait for the mic. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, the purpose of the large loading gauge on the Marylebone line was for Watkins' plan, which you, you may know about, to build a railway from Manchester to Paris yes. that would take continental rolling stock and he owned various railways that he was going to stitch together and build a channel tunnel. Um, which he started. Yeah. Which he started, about half a mile of it. The, the, war, in, the war office supposed yes. it, I believe. Yeah. Yes, right. Yes, that is true. He was going to build a, a, a line all the way from London to Paris. Uh, from, from Sheffield to Paris, actually. Manchester and Sheffield to Paris. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, John, are you, uh, you got right. So it's an online one. 
Yes, an online question. Um, there's, uh, I have heard that there is uh, one stage with 13,000 horses based in King's Cross to service the deliveries. Is, is that true or something like that? Uh, yes, no, I've, I've seen uh, uh, similar numbers. I mean, it was a, a complete... That, that picture I, I showed, which, which I can, I can uh, uh, go back to, uh, is a very neat kind of picture at this stage. And in fact, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it was complete chaos of, of uh, goods being taken onto the canal, uh, warehouses where you loaded up three or four flights of them, uh, coal drops, um, so on. It, it, it employed several thousand people. So I can quite happily believe the, the figure of 13,000 horses. And as ever with the problem with the horses is it must have been not a very pleasant smell. Because <laughs> uh, we all have this rather romantic idea that everybody wants the manure. In fact, uh, London in the late 19th century accumulated vast amounts of manure that they, they didn't need for any purpose and, and was a major problem kind of clearing. So if there were 13,000 horses, it must have been kind of quite difficult to uh, breathe there. So that, that one. You mentioned the developments at um, London Bridge and King's Cross. Which station would you pick next to have a development, a significant development, if the money was available? Oh, that's an easy question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Victoria is, uh, really could do with, uh, uh, with sorting out. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not a particularly... Uh, a pleasant environment. It's got a rather tacky shopping centre halfway above it, and uh, so on. And uh, it could do with, uh, actually, it could do with with the lines from Brighton being extended so that you didn't then have to kind of go in different. So, Victoria is my choice. <laughs> and it is a sorry, uh, uh, John. Done. Yeah. yeah, another online question. Yeah. Um, how did the railway companies get the right to demolish so many houses? And, and what does that say about the Victorian age? Very good question, uh, Mr. On or Mrs. Online. Um, uh, essentially, they would go to Parliament and they'd get permission uh, uh, to uh, build the railway line. And that included essentially demolishing anything in the way. Um, they... They sort of had to come to uh, some agreement with the landlords, but not with the tenants. Um, and they, they would have to, uh, you know, possibly buy the uh, landlord's land, but not at, a, they, not at a kind of market value, really, just at a kind of fixed price, because they had the right to do it. And that's why uh, some of these lines were objected to by... Uh, uh, people in the way who, who, you know, and particularly as ever, it was the rich who managed to stop the lines being built through their territory and, and the poor uh, got very, very little stay, say in it. Um, and of course, what's interesting about this, there's a whole history to be written here because it did change over the Victorian period. So in the 1830s and 40s, uh, the railway companies were able to ride roughshod over uh, uh, these uh, uh, poorer people. By the back end of the Victorian era, when they were still building uh, and expanding some railway stations and the like, it was much more difficult to do that. And Maryland had to, had to uh, the developers of, of uh, Maryland, the Great Central Railway, had to pay vast amounts uh, to, uh, in compensation. And also they got stopped from digging up lords. They had wanted to dig up lords, uh, cricket ground, um, and uh, uh, and create a kind of embankment there. And that got stopped, and they had to go underneath Lords. And uh, they had to dig the tunnel and fill it in again uh, between September and April so it wouldn't disrupt the cricket season. So if you were the right sort of person, you could kind of influence the process. But if you were just at the bottom of the pile, it was very difficult to do so. It uh, was ever thus, though, and it's probably still the same now. Any more, John? I don't think there's any more in the audience. Yeah, I've, I've got one more. The, the okay. names of the stations, um, why aren't they so more interesting? <laughs> yeah, I haven't done much, much thinking about that. Uh, um, uh, I mean, King's Cross is actually in Battle Bridge, which, you know, it could have, it could have been 
call that St Pancras is named after the area that, and the church that was there and is an obscure shepherd boy who was uh, uh, murdered by the, the Romans for refusing to uh, give up on Christianity um, in something like uh, 600 or 700 AD. Um, a really obscure saint. Um, uh, uh, Charing Cross is an obvious one. I mean, it, there is the cross, right? In, uh, you know, that is the, uh, the, the distance marker for um, uh, the mileage o away from London. So that's, uh, that's obviously a Victoria's homage, of course, to uh, the Queen. Um, uh, and then there's some fairly dull names like Fenchurch Street and Liverpool Street and Blackfriars. Um, which all named after uh, the streets they're in. So, yes, a very good point. I think I think we could have a competition to give more interesting names to uh, uh, London's railway stations. Right, I think I think that's it, John. Any more for no, nothing more online? Okay, then uh, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the trouble to be here. Thank you, online audience, for uh, listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk. And next time I might see you here uh, uh, in person because it's much more fun uh, but I do appreciate that not everybody can get here and thank you for attending thank you, thank you.